Now, chapter 10, it's kind of a long chapter. What's interesting, I mean, this, this entire chapter is dedicated to basically just one story. And there's just one main theme of this entire chapter. And we see here in the story, basically just a, a broad overview, we see that, that um, there's a, we're introduced to a man named Cornelius. He's, you know, he's a just guy before God. He's, you know, he, he's, he prays. He's a devout man. You know, he's seeking God. He's, you know, he gives alms to, to God. He, you know, he does all these things. He's, he's a pretty decent guy. He's a pretty good guy. You know, an angel appears to him and says, hey, send for Peter. So he does, and Peter's, well, after he sends for him, Peter's praying. You know, he, he was waiting for food to be made, and then he falls into a trance, and he sees his vision. And his vision is these animals that come down from heaven, and, um, you know, he hears a voice saying, you know, kill and eat, and he's saying, you know, no, I've never, I've never eaten anything that's unclean before. And, um, you know, he sees his vision, happens three times, the people show up, and the Spirit says, okay, just go with them. Just don't, don't worry about it, just go with them. Don't worry about it. I said, okay, so he goes, Peter goes, he meets the men, goes back, and then preaches Jesus unto Cornelius and to everyone in his house. And then, you know, um, the Holy Ghost comes upon them, and then they're able to speak with other tongues, and they get baptized. And that's basically the whole story. Now, the main theme of the story is this, is this um, you know, the unclean beasts, and the basically the dietary restrictions are being lifted. And, and God is showing Peter this, that, that that is no longer in effect. And it also helps us to understand a, little, a lot of its symbolism. You see, a lot of the laws, especially like in the Mosaic Law, things were established, the, law, the laws were established with the sacrifices and with these dietary restrictions and with many of the other things. They were all symbolic. Now, they all had to be obeyed and followed as law. But at the same time, they also serve the purpose of giving them some understanding and being prophetic about things that were going to happen. And they were also there just for a reason. I mean, circumcision had a symbolic reason. Um, you know, the, the, the Passover lamb was very symbolic. And the dietary restrictions were symbolic as well. We're going to learn a little bit about the meaning of the dietary restrictions as we get into this. So let's look down at our Bibles. Look at, look at verse number one. And that's just to give you just kind of a whole, just a main overview this is, you know, this entire chapter is dedicated to this, to this main topic here. So we're going to dig into it a little bit deeper. So it was in verse 1, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. So he was a soldier. A centurion means that he had basically like 100 soldiers underneath him. He was kind of like a captain. He was a centurion. He, had, he, was, he was over 100 soldiers. It says he was a devout man in verse number 2, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people. So he was a generous guy. You know, he, he, he gave charity. He gave alms to the people and prayed to God always. And then it says in verse 3, He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. So God recognized and says, Okay, I see your prayers and I see, I see you giving alms. So I'm gonna, you know, I'm basically gonna answer your prayer here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna have a man sent to you that's gonna preach unto you. And um, it says in verse five, and now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. It's very similar to the story we saw with um, Saul. Remember the apostle Paul? Saul was on the way to, on the road to Damascus. And, and Jesus Christ spoke with them, and he said, you know, go into this town, and there, you know, someone's going to tell you what, what you need to do. And this is a very similar event that's happening here, where an angel appears to Cornelius and says, okay, call for Simon, call for Simon Peter. He's going to tell you what you ought to do. Verse number seven, it says, and when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually, and when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. So he basically listens. He sends, he sends a couple servants and a soldier for protection and says, okay, go call for, go call for Simon Peter. Go to Joppa. And then in verse 9 here, we're going to see it from Peter's perspective. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So Peter goes up. He's going off to get by himself to go pray unto God. 
It says in verse 10, And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So Peter's pretty hungry. And it says here he, he wanted to eat. He basically was ready to eat. But, you know, whoever was cooking the food was slacking off, and it was taking a really long time. Hopefully he got a really good meal out of it because he waited so long. But um, he was waiting, you know, so he wanted to eat. But while he's waiting, he's praying, and he says the Bible says he falls into a trance. Okay? So, and then he sees this vision. So he's probably pretty hungry. Normally, like, I mean, in order to fall into a trance, you got to be, I, I, I'm thinking you got to be pretty, you know, at a physically your state is going to be, you know, he was probably really hungry. He might have been fasting already. It doesn't say specifically, like, like if he'd been fasting for a while already and he was just waiting to eat. Um, but he falls into this trance, nonetheless. And he sees this vision. It says, And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knitted the four corners and let down to the earth. So basically it's like this big hot air balloon. Right? There's a sheet knitted in the four corners, and there's a bunch of animals in it. It's just floating down to earth. Right? So this is the vision that he's seeing. And it says, Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the earth. So he sees all kinds of animals. You know, four-footed beasts, he sees bugs, insects, creeping things, you know, birds. All kinds of things are, are in this... In this um, in this vessel, basically, that's, that's descending from heaven. It's just floating down the earth. And then he hears a voice in verse 13. It says, And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. That is pretty interesting because Peter's up there and he's just really hungry, right? So he's got to be thinking, like, Man, what kind of a crazy daydream is this? Like, like he sees these animals floating down, like, Rise, Peter, slay, and eat. Right? And um, it's a good thing he didn't just write this off as, as just, oh, well, I was real hungry. And so I just had this crazy dream and this crazy vision. Because this was actually, I mean, this is a vision from God. And it's telling him, you know, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Peter said, no, uh, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And this is where I see, I'm gonna, we're going to go into, turn if you would, keep your finger in Acts chapter 10 because we're coming back to it, obviously. But turn if you would to Leviticus chapter number 11. Because we're going to see. Um, the law under the Levitical priesthood and the ordinance that they had against eating unclean animals. So when Peter sees this, you know, these animals that are descending from heaven, and he hears a voice tell him to eat, he's saying, no, you know, like, no, I won't. Like, even though I'm super hungry, I'm not going to do it because I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. I, I, I've obeyed that commandment. I'm not, I'm not going to break that commandment. And um, if you're in uh, Leviticus, Look, chapter number 11, look at verse number 2. This is just exactly, we're not going to go through the whole thing because there's lots of restrictions on this. We're just, gonna, just to give you an idea of, um, of what we're talking about here and what Peter was talking about, why he didn't want to eat. Leviticus 11, 2 says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. So he's saying, okay, you can eat those types of animals that fall under this criteria. Verse number four. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divide the hoof. As the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. So now he starts going into, and you know, it goes on and on and on, just kind of explaining, giving all these detailed rules of, well, you can eat this type of animal, not this. And this is why. You know, and these are the things that you look for. These are the traits in the animal that you look at and say, well, this is the type of animal we could eat. Is it, you know, is it cloven-footed? Does it chew the cud? You know, are they, these are the, the rules that we're using. He gives them plenty of examples and said, you can eat, you know, you can't eat camels, you can't eat conies, and this is why. And it goes on and on with all these different types of creatures explaining, this animal's unclean, this is clean, you can eat this, this is unclean. Don't eat that. Now, it's important to note out, too, that prior to, the, to, to Levitical law, to Levitical priest, the Mosaic law that was, that was given down, these restrictions did not exist. God did not have dietary restrictions. Um, basically, after the flood, man was, was able to eat freely of, of all beasts and all manner of creeping things, basically anything. Man was given free reign to eat whatever he wanted to. Um, Prior to that, 
man didn't eat any flesh of any animal. They were basically, a man was like a vegetarian in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. After sin, and after, you know, there needed to be a blood sacrifice and all these things, um, you know, that, that ended up changing. And after the flood, God opened it up. He said, okay, you could basically just eat, you could eat anything. And, um, I think it was after, it was, um, in any case, that the, the dietary restriction didn't exist as it did in the Mosaic Law. This was, um, this was something new that was given to them that they had to follow, and we're going to learn a little bit more about this um, in the book of Acts here in Acts chapter 10. But basically, you see here, all these, all these rules, all these laws, jump down to verse 44 in Leviticus 11. The Bible says, um, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves. Sanctify means set apart. You sanctify yourselves, and ye, sh and ye shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And we're going to continue on here, but we see one of the reasons that God is telling them, look, I'm giving you this dietary restriction. I'm telling you, you can't eat these beasts. These beasts are unclean unto you. You can't have those. I'm calling you out. I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. You're separate from the world. You're going to be a peculiar people. You're going to be a little bit different. You're going to obey these rules that I've set forth for you. And it's just going to prove, I mean, you are a different people. And that's the way we ought to be as Christians today. You know, you shouldn't just be like every single other person in the world. You should stand out a little bit. If you're going to obey God's commandments, see like the heathen around them, they didn't have these dietary restrictions. And if a person decided just not to obey God's laws, they would be just like any other heathen around them. Well, it's the same way with us. If we choose to obey God's laws and really to obey his commandments, we ought to be different than the world. See, everyone else out in the world, they don't care that much about God's laws. They don't care about obeying them. They don't care about following them. They don't care about implementing them in their lives. But if you're going to be a follower of God, if you're going to be someone who's going to say, you know what, I want to obey God's commandments. Then, you're, then that's going to make you holy. That's going to make you sacred. That's going to make you separate by obeying and following and doing what God tells you to do. And you know what else is going to mean? You're going to be a little bit different than the world. Actually, you should be a lot different than the world. These people at this time, you know, God's people, if they, if they listened to this and, and obeyed all of God's commandments, they were very different than the world that was around them. And this is one of the things that he's doing. He's kind of making a point. You're going to be separate. You're going to be different. Look at verse number 46. It says, this is the law of the beasts and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. So he's saying very specifically there in Leviticus chapter 11, go ahead and turn if you would to Hebrews chapter number 7. Back in Leviticus, that was the, that was the law and God was doing it specifically because, hey, I, he said, I want to make a difference between the clean and the unclean. He's, made, he's drawing a line, he's drawing a dividing line saying, this is clean, this is not clean. And of course, it's, as with so many of God's laws in the Old Testament, it's symbolic. Okay, now if, if there was something that was absolutely, truly like, like unclean about some of those animals, then he wouldn't have lifted the dietary restriction later of like, well, now you can eat it. And he would have had that restriction beforehand if there was something just inherently like, like just unclean about, about what he was doing there. But he was making a point. If God says, hey, this is, this is unclean, this is clean, um, then that's the way it is. And, that's, and, and we ought to do that. Now, a lot of these animals you probably wouldn't eat anyways. I mean, they, they, there's no law against it, but they still, you still might look at them and be like, man, that's not clean, right? <laughs> like, um, I know a lot of people, I, and I do too, I'll eat shrimp, but shrimp is not, not a very clean animal to eat. They're, they're a bottom feeder, you know, they eat a lot of junk that's on the bottom, but, you know, thank God we're not under the, the Mosaic Law anymore as far as that dietary restriction goes, because a lot of people like shrimp, it tastes good. But, um, but that was one of the things, you know, that people can eat today. And, um, 
you know, God's lifted that. We're going to see here in Hebrews chapter 7, that's where you are. Look at verse number 11. He explains, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. And turn to Hebrews chapter 9 if you would. So he's explaining here that with Jesus Christ there's a change of the law because he changed the priesthood. Um, with the Mosaic law, you know, the children of Levi were the ones who were the priests. They were the ones that were, that were doing the service of God in the tabernacle of witness. They were the ones that had the responsibility. And specifically the sons of Aaron were the, were the priests and that were carrying out the, um, the, the, the priesthood, the priesthood jobs. But when Jesus Christ came, he came. He was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He was not of the sons of Levi. He came from the tribe of Judah. And because, he, because the priesthood is kind of changing, he's saying, look, there's also going to be a, a change in the law here. And we go on, and Hebrews is a very good, very good explanation. If you want to understand a lot of differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament, read the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was, was preached and written unto people who were of that Jewish descent that were, that were Hebrews by, you know, um, physically. They were physically born of Abraham, and they were given the laws of God. And, and the Apostle Paul writes this to help them to understand what the New Testament is versus the Old Testament and help them know the differences in what was changed and what was made different. Look at verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter 9. It says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So he kind of goes on and explains the tabernacle and explains what they had, that there was a worldly sanctuary, there was a physical sanctuary that was here that was, you know, a lot of the ordinances had to do with that worldly sanctuary under that first covenant. Look, jump down to verse number eight. It says, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. <coughs> Excuse me. So we see here, he explains very clearly in verse number 10 that that, that tabernacle and that their sacrifices, all these things that they were doing, it was a figure, it was a picture for the time then present. It was something that they used then, it was just a figure. He said they offered gifts and sacrifices, and he said they couldn't make them that did the service are perfect. The blood of bulls and goats, that couldn't wash away their sins. It was something that they were supposed to do as part of the law, but it was all these pictures, all symbolic of what was to come, it was symbolic of Jesus Christ that was gonna come and take away the sins of the whole world. And there was lots of symbolism in the meats and the drinks, the divers' washings, the carnal ordinances. These things all provided a way to learn greater truths and to learn other things and to learn prophecy and things that were going to come. <clears throat> and it says these were imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So these things only lasted, especially these things that were listed here in this sentence in verse 10. Meats, drinks, divers' washings, and carnal ordinances. Those were the things that were imposed until the time of Reformation. It doesn't include the entire law. It just it includes these specific things that were, you know, uh, that had to do with the service in the tabernacle and the, and the offering of sac excuse me, sacrifices that were until the time of Reformation. <clears throat> when <clears throat> the Levitical priesthood was reformed and changed to the, to the order, under the order of Melchizedek. Now turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 14. We get a little bit more insight on this. <clears throat> Thank you. Romans chapter 14, look at verse number 2. And we went over this uh, last week on Sunday about judging people. It says, in verse 2, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. 
Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So he's saying here that the person who eats all things, they're free to eat all things, they're not weak. The person who thinks that they can only eat herbs, they're the ones that are weak. But um, he's opened it up, and basically he's telling us, don't despise either person, whether they eat or don't eat. Now jump down to verse number 13. It says, let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus, this is important here, that there is nothing unclean of itself. So just in and of itself, there's nothing unclean is what he's saying. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So he's saying, if you, <clears throat> and this is important to understand, this isn't what the sermon's about tonight, but if you think something's a sin, even if something is not a sin, right? Like in this example, there's someone who only, is basically a vegetarian, they only eat herbs. If that person thinks it's a sin to eat meat, if they think that that's wrong by God, and then they go and eat meat, that person is sinning. That is sin to them. That is unclean to them. Even though eating meat is not a sin, we know that it's not a sin. If you think something's wrong and then you do it anyways, that's a sin. That is unclean to you. The Bible says, <clears throat> so it doesn't even matter if it, if it truly is or isn't. If you think it is, I mean, just, just that thought in your heart of you know, knowing that you're doing something and doing something that you believe is wrong, that's a sin. God doesn't like to see that. So that's a bad attitude to have. That you're going to go and do something that you think is wrong anyways and you're just going to do it. But it's important to know that, that that is a sin. To him it is unclean. Look at verse number 15. It says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So he's saying, okay, but look, if someone's got a real serious problem with that, there's no reason why you have to just basically put it in their face and just and use that as just a stumbling block for them. Um, you know, show some charity. Where they said, if someone's really offended by that and you go out and they think it's wrong for you to eat meat and you go out to eat with them, you know, don't order the T-bone steak and just and just rub it in their face and just be like, ah, oh, I'm going to be eating this thing. You know, he's like, you know, show some charity, show some love for that person. You know, understand that that they're weaker because it's not, there's nothing wrong with it, but you don't need to be flaunting it in front of them and, and just doing it in front of them. But, um, you know, the Bible says the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink. And it's important here that he says, because he said in verse 14, nothing is unclean of itself. But see, those animals weren't unclean of themselves. But when God said they're unclean and said not to eat them, they are unclean. And you're not allowed to eat them. Okay? And that's why Peter said, Lord, nothing unclean or common has ever come into my mouth. He said, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. He knew that law. He knew that that was in, in place. And he said, look, I'm not going to eat that. Even though I'm super hungry, you know, I'm waiting for people to make me food. I'm not going to eat that food. Um, because, you know, I know the law. I'm not going to do that. But in the New Testament here we see, and we went to a couple of New Testament scriptures as a kind of prove that you know, in addition to this vision that Peter saw, you know, it, it has been done away. The, that, that, that's why we went to Hebrews. That's why we went to Romans 14. Turn back to Acts chapter 10, if you would. Um, we, we went back to that just to kind of show you that, look, this has been lifted. This has been removed. And this is kind of a major event for Peter. This is where he learns that, that, this, is, um, that this is no longer in effect. Because we left off at verse number 14 where Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And verse 15 says, And the boy spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And it says this was done thrice. So basically the same exact thing happens three times. He sees the animals coming down, says, you know, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And you know, he gives the same answer. And God says, you know, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common common and um so three times this happens now peter doesn't quite get it right away right he says now while peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean 
Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So basically what happens is Peter sees his vision, he's up on the roof, and that's just at the time when these people show up from Cornelius. And the spirit, now, now he's, he's thinking on this vision, he's not quite sure what it means. He's just kind of thinking like, what in the world just happened? What does that mean? You know, trying to figure it out. The spirit then tells him, he says, look, there's some guys at the door for asking for you right now. Go with them. You know, don't, don't doubt, just go with them. You know, basically I've sent them, go with them, don't worry about it. So Peter receives them, you know, they spend the night there. And next day, they're headed out. They're going, they're going into Caesarea. And then on uh, verse 24, it says, And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. So Cornelius is excited. He's like, you know, what are we going to hear? Like, this is awesome. You know, an angel answered him. He sent the men out right away to go to Peter. And he's like, he's calling his friends. He's calling his family. And he's like, come on, everyone, you know, everyone come join around. We want to hear what's, what, what he's going to say to us. Verse 25, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. So he's so excited. I mean, he goes a little overboard here. Peter shows up. He falls down at his feet and starts worshiping him. Now that is something he's definitely not supposed to be doing. You know, the Bible says that we're only supposed to worship God and him alone. It says, and then verse 26 says, but Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. So Peter rebukes him. He said, look, like, I'm just a man, you know, like, like get up off your feet. Now, I want to point out here because, you know, the Bible says we're not supposed to worship any man, only God. In, verse, in Luke 4, 7, the Bible says, If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. This is when uh, the devil was, was trying to tempt Jesus Christ in the wilderness. He says, if you worship me, hey, all this stuff is going to be mine. Basically, I'm going to give you the world if you just fall down and worship me. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. We're only supposed to serve God. We're only supposed to worship God. Now, in the Bible, worshiping, I'm not going to get into this too much, but when the Bible uses that word worship, basically what that is, it's when you get down, when you get down on your knees in front of someone, or just, you know, just kind of like by your head, that's worshiping. You know, a lot of people will use the word worship and then that when we sing songs unto God, you know, that's their worship. People call church the worship service and things like that. But look up the word worship. And the vast majority of the time, you're going to see people getting on their knees in front of somebody else. And, be, and just being low and humble in front of them. And, and down on their face and down on their knees in front of them. That's worshiping. Okay, so when, when you have like these idols that are set up in the Catholic Church or in other places. and I mean, it doesn't matter where it is. When you have these statues that are built up and you have people that come down and they kneel and maybe they say a prayer or whatever they do and they get down on their knees and they put down their face, hey, they're worshiping that idol. They're worshiping a graven image. That is something you're not supposed to do. You say, oh, well, I'm just, I'm praying unto God as I kneel down for us. No, you're worshiping that idol. You may not even realize it, but that's exactly what you're doing. That's one of the reasons, one of the things, it was before I was even saved, but um, <laughs> it, it was kind of silly, but I realized there's different cultures and different things, but I, I was taking a martial arts class, and one of the things that we were supposed to do, and this always rubbed me wrong, even when I wasn't saved, they had this picture of this man that was like, I don't even know who he was, I mean, he was some guy that was like real high up in the martial art, or, or maybe the founder of it, or whatever, and they would have this picture of and before we started our, our training for the day, we'd all have to just like kind of, we'd get down on the mat 
and just and just do like a bow like on our knees to this stupid picture. That was wrong. I, I, I didn't realize it at the time. I mean, it didn't feel right. Some of this kind of seemed weird, but I was thinking like, well, whatever. It's their culture and, and whatever. That was wrong to do that. I mean, that's that's worship. That's that'd be me wor- you know, worshiping some image, some image of a man. <coughs> It's not right to do that. But keep that in mind. There's, I'll probably have to preach a sermon about that, about just worship in general and, and prove it from the Bible. How, you know, just, just when people get down on their knees in front of someone that's considered worshiping them. I mean, it's exactly what, what this guy did, right? In this story, in verse 25, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet and worshiped him. So the, the fact that he just, he just drops down in front of Peter's feet, that's how he worshiped him. It says, but Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. He's saying, look, don't, you know, don't be worshiping me. Stand up on your feet in front of me. You don't need to bow down in front of me. And that's another reason why we're never going to have people, we're never going to have an altar where people are going to come up and bow down in, in, in front of a man that's standing you know, up on this altar. Because that's just way too close to, to worshiping a man or worshiping something that's up there. And I realize, again, they say, well, we're just praying unto God. We're getting on our knees. And yeah, you should get on your knees and pray to God, but that's worshiping God when you get on your knees before God. Don't get on your knees before a man or you know, before someone that's standing up there. Um, that's ungodly. That, that's, that's way, that, even if you're not worshiping a man, like if there's no man there, to me that's just cutting it way too close. We're never going to do that here. And, um, the other point I'll point out about worshiping and worshiping a man, you'll see Peter here prevents this man from doing that. He knows that, you know, that man's sinning. He's a little, you know, stop that. You know, I'm a man. Don't worship me. Other people have done the same thing. Jesus Christ never stopped anybody from worshiping him. Now, he might have told some of the devils that that were declaring him to, to hold their peace and not to talk about him. But he never refused worship from people. Even though he, he himself said... Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That was his response to the devil. Yet in, in many instances, I'll just read a couple of them for you. In Matthew 8, verse 2, the Bible says, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And did Jesus just say, Well, get up, don't worship me. Get up off your knees. No. Jesus, it says, And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. He received that worship. Matthew 14, says, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Again, no response from Jesus saying, Don't worship me. Only worship God. Because Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Jesus Christ was not a sinner. The Bible very clearly states that he was not a sinner. If he was receiving worship of men when he shouldn't have been receiving worship, that would be sin unto him. One more example, there's, there's plenty of these in the Bible. I'll give one more. John 9, 35 says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Jesus was claiming right there to be the Son of God. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Verse 39, and Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Again, did nothing to stop the worship. Jesus received worship because he's worthy of worship, because he's God in the flesh, because he's dear Christ. Just a, just a side note in the sermon, but it's important to note that and to realize there's just one more evidence, one more shred of evidence, one more piece of evidence just proving that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Jesus Christ was worthy of worship, and he never refused it as Peter did. Now, if someone comes up and falls on you before you, you ought to do like Peter did and say, Hey, look, I'm just a man. Stand up. Don't worship me. There's too many false religions out there today where, where the people get on their knees in front of a man, and they're basically just worshiping him. They do it for the Pope. I mean, it's, it's, it's rampant in the, in the Catholicism. That is one of the, one of the, the, the worst cases that's out there of people who worship people and worship idols and fall down before these false these 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 images and worship them. 
But let's continue on with the story. We're going to move on past that point. Um, we're back in Acts chapter 10. Let's continue here, verse uh, 27. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So first of all, here's, here's kind of where he's putting it together and he gets it. Or he's at least stating it that he, that he understands what was going on now with his, with his vision. The first thing I want to point out though is that he says, Ye know, ye know talking to, the, to Cornelius and his people, the Gentiles that were gathered together there, ye know how that is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now, that law, that is not God's law. God did not make that law that said you cannot, a Jew cannot keep company or come unto one of another nation. God never made that law. I was racking my brain. I've read this before and I was thinking, I'm like, is this, is this a man-made law or is, this, or is this God's law? Because when they say words is like unlawful, you know, it's not necessarily clear. So I'm thinking, and I was, I was looking back, I'm like, there is nothing in God's law. There's nothing in the Old Testament that said that if you are a Jew, you cannot keep company with someone from another nation. In fact, many people were made Jews. Many people from other nations became Jews. They would move and they would dwell there. And the Bible says that... Um, there is one law for the people of the land that, that whether they're a stranger or not, that there was one law that was to apply for all of them. Now, there was a few things that they were restricted from doing, depending on where they were coming from, um, you know, which nation they were from. Um, there was restrictions on them becoming part of the priesthood. There was restrictions on them eating of some of the holy things that were offered, you know, by the priest. And um, there were things that they had to do, you know, being circumcised in order to, to receive the Passover and things like that. But they were still accepted into the nation and they became a Jew. They became just like anyone else. as someone from another nation. So this physical seed, it didn't, it didn't matter. But we see at this time that there was a law that was implemented. And because Peter was saying that it was unlawful for him to go for being a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. This was just a man-made law. And this is something that's kind of indicative of the false prophet Jews in that time because what had happened is they got this, this superiority complex as, as has happened throughout history with many groups of people. They think that their race is superior. They think that, you know, they've kind of got a little bit of a proud attitude thinking that, well, we're God's chosen people. And they twisted it into thinking that because they were physically Abraham's seed, that, that somehow they were above other people, that, that they were better than other people. And, that, and, and a lot of them thought that that was their ticket into heaven because they were physically descended from Abraham. When the Bible says God is able these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham, that doesn't matter. Your physical descendants, he called, he called people who were physically descended from Abel, Abraham children of the devil. He said, you are the children of the devil. You're the children of your father. Your father is the devil. That's what Jesus Christ said unto them. It doesn't matter physically where you're born. That's not where the, where the special you know, uh, blessing comes from or even being God's people. It comes from faith. That when you believe on Jesus Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And, you know, again, we go on and on about that, but we see here that just they even made this law where they said, well, yeah, you can't even keep company with, with foreigners. You can't go unto the Gentiles. It's unlawful for you to do that. And a lot of people, I think they had this mixed up. Um, even, you know, even saved people. We saw, we'll see later in the book of Acts where, where Peter is, um, you know, they, they get up and they don't eat with the Gentiles. When people come from James, um, you know, Barnabas is carried away under dissimulation. We'll go over that when we get into that chapter. But, um, you know, there's, there's certain things culturally that were, you know, and there's certain man-made laws that had an impact on them. I mean, just like false doctrine can have an impact on us today. Things that are, are preached and taught and just repeated over and over again. You know, we got to fight against these, these man-made laws 
and, and make sure that everything that we believe and, and everything that we preach and teach is found specifically in the Bible. It's not just some corruption or perversion of God's law. This law that Peter's talking about is not one of God's laws. But I think one of the reasons why God shows him this vision and then just says, hey, go with these people. Don't doubt about it. Just go with them. He's teaching them here like he says in, um, in verse 29. Therefore came I unto you, or it says in verse, at the end of verse 28, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So he understands that the vision, when God was showing him that the, you know, the beasts of the earth, and he's telling him to kill and eat them, and he's saying not so because I haven't eaten anything that's, that's, that's common or unclean, what he's really teaching him was a greater truth that you're not supposed to call you know, any man common or unclean. You know, just because they weren't of the children of Israel, hey, that, that restriction, that's, that's, that's null and void. You know, that law is meaningless that they had. There's no reason why you can't go unto and keep company with someone, with a Gentile. There's no reason why you can't um, eat with them. And what happens also in the New Testament and New Covenant is that you know, in the Old Testament, God had used his chosen people. He used the tabernacle. He used the Jews to, to, to pen down the Bible. That was his chosen nation. That was what he chose to be like, you know, a light shining in the darkness of the world. That was the one nation where, he, where the Lord was being worshipped, the Lord was being preached, and he was, he was reaching people, he was using people of that nation to preach his word. He was revealing the oracles of God unto them. And he did that all the way up until the time of Jesus Christ. Um, it was that specific people that he had chosen to be his nation, to be his people, that were going to preach his word. But in the New Testament, that's opened up. It's no longer, you know, he's, he's removed um, the people. That, you know, when Jesus Christ came unto his own, his own rejected him, his own received him not. He removed that authority that and that and that that uniqueness and that specialness that that nation had. And he says, they give it unto the nation bearing the fruits thereof. They no longer are that lighthouse. They no longer are that, that beacon of light in the world. He's opened it up now to other people. And he was using these animals and the, and the dietary restrictions and calling these animals, some animals are unclean, these are clean. You know, you need to keep them separate. Well, that's the same way. Now, no longer are you are you in this, you know, in keeping kind of keeping your religion in in um, in Jerusalem and in Israel. He told them to go out. Now, when Jesus was on his word on this earth, he stayed within that region. He stayed and preached and taught and tried to get people saved within that region. But when he was leaving, when he left, he said, "Now go out into all the world. You know, no man is common or unclean. Go out and get them saved." Go out, start churches, and, and, and um, go out unto the Gentiles, go out into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature because he's teaching them here, you know, no man is common or unclean. This is part of the change that happened from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And this is a teaching that he taught, taught Peter here. And this is kind of the main theme of this whole story where it's this vision and then he goes and he goes unto these, these Gentiles specifically. I mean, Cornelius... Were, you know they were they were in Caesarea, um, they were not Jews, but um, we're going to see here that they believed in Jesus Christ, and um, Peter was told to go unto them, and he went, and, and this, he saw the vision. The Spirit told him, "This is definitely of God." Um, verse twenty nine says, "Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore for what intent ye have sent me sent for me." So now. At this point, he understands the vision, but now he's just saying, okay, well, why did you call me here? You know, he understands that the thing with the animals, yeah, the dietary restrictions are removed, but that was symbolic of people. That was symbolic of, of, of not having this attitude towards other people, of calling them unclean. But now he wants to know, okay, well, why am I here? Verse 30, and Cornelius said, four days ago, he tells him the story, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are hand remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a Tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, 
And thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. So he's saying, well, I saw a vision telling, you know, where the angel told me to send for you. So he's basically saying, like, I don't know why you're here. You tell me why you're here. You know, like, like I did what I was supposed to do. I called for you. Now we're ready to hear. You know, tell us what God, you know, what God has for us. Tell us what God has commanded you. Verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. So again, he's understanding this. God's not a respecter of persons. That means that just because of you, who you are, like, like physically who you are growing up in this world, God doesn't respect that. It doesn't mean anything to God. It doesn't matter who your parents were. It doesn't matter how much money you are. It doesn't matter if you were of, the, of, of Abraham's seed, physically speaking. God's not a respecter of person, persons. That stuff doesn't matter to him. It says, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So he's saying it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or not. And he, Peter's getting it. He understands. He says, look, now I perceive, now I understand. It doesn't matter where you're from. If you, you know, fear God, you work righteousness, he's going to accept you. Verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Again, just reiterating, look, Jesus Christ is Lord of all, of everybody. Not just Lord of the Jews, he's Lord of everybody. And that's what, that's another thing I don't, you know, it's kind of common, you hear people from another, you know, another, uh, uh, another nationality, whether it be someone from like Saudi Arabia, or um, someone literally like from Africa, or somebody from, um, uh, you know, a Native American, they'll say, oh, you know, Christianity, that's a white man's religion. You know, that's, that's just for you. We have our own religion. No, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Lord of, of, of everyone in the whole earth. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what nation you're born. It's not something that's just for the white man. It's for everybody. God is the God of all. And that's what he's saying here too. Look at verse 37. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. So he's saying, you know this because this was published throughout all Judea. This was published everywhere. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. So he's telling them here that this entire story of Jesus Christ. Uh, not the entire story, but he's, you know, he's telling them what happened, that how they witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They witnessed the things that he did. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. <clears throat> this is um, a great verse here in verse 43. Because it says, to him give all the prophets witness. So every single prophet, every single book of the Old Testament, all the prophets preach about Jesus Christ. Every single one. And that's pretty amazing. Because you can look at books and be like, and, and study it. And I've, I've looked at this before too. So I wonder where this book talks about Jesus. But they all do. I mean, some are a little bit more symbolic than others. But they all, but they all I mean, if otherwise this isn't true. I mean, the Bible says, Peter said right here, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. The gospel, believing in Jesus Christ, has been witnessed by every single prophet of God. That's what the Bible's saying right here. From, from Genesis to Revelation, all the prophets give witness to Jesus Christ. And it says that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now we're going to get again into baptism in my last point here with the last few verses because we see very clearly that Whoever believes in him are the ones that receive remission of sins. And that, the, you know, that wording there, that phrase remission of sins is important because 
The Pentecostals are going to use that, and that's where they say, well, that's why you get baptism is for the remission of sins. And I went over that a little bit in my sermon on baptism on Sunday, where, where they'll say that's why you get baptized is for the remission of sins. Well, the Bible says right here that whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. It doesn't say anything about baptism. And we'll go on further here reading this story. It says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Now, someone's got to show these Pentecostals. They've got to read their Bible and read Acts chapter number 10 because their entire doctrine just falls on its head in so many places, but, but so abundantly here. I mean, they believe that baptism is required for salvation, and they also believe that um, you know, speaking in tongues is evidence that you're saved, right? But you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, what do, you, what do they say about these people? They were not baptized. The Bible says here that you know, if you believe on him, you receive remission of sins. It says nothing about baptism. They were speaking with other tongues before they were even baptized. So according to the stupid Pentecostal religion, how could they even be saved? Yet they were speaking with tongues. Well, that kind of destroys their whole doctrine of, well, you need to be baptized to be saved. They weren't baptized until after they were speaking with other tongues. They had that before the baptism even happened. So which is it? Which comes first? They'll say that you've got to be baptized, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then the, the speaking in tongues, which is, which is nonsense what they do anyways. It's not speaking with other tongues, as the Bible says. It's a bunch of gibberish. They weren't even baptized yet. So if you have any Pentecostal friends, this is a great chapter to use. Show them Acts chapter 10 because, I mean, you've got the receiving remission of sins just through believing. It has nothing to do with baptism. You have people receiving the Holy Ghost prior to being baptized and then getting baptized afterward. Completely destroys their, their salvation doctrine. And hopefully you can use that. Use this word. Remember Acts chapter 10 to do this for anyone that you know that, that believes in that doctrine because this alone ought to be able to, to prove without a doubt, that, that what they're believing is false. I mean, you can't deny the scripture. Now, as I said before, you know, the main, the main point of this chapter, what we're trying to get across, was the, you know, the lifting of the dietary restrictions when, when Peter saw that vision, and um, the symbolism that, that, it's, that it, it, it really is applying to all people. This is not something that, um, and you know, and nobody... Nobody should. And it's happened through so many different races throughout history where people just kind of think where, that they're just superior and they're better than anyone else. You know, we ought not to have that. No one ought to have that attitude. We ought not to think that for whatever reason, maybe you grew up in a Christian home, you're just better than somebody else or, um, you know, because you had that opportunity. Just like, the, you know, the Jews shouldn't be thinking. And there's Jews today that think that just because that they're physically descended from, from Abraham to some degree at some point that they're going to go to heaven because they're elected, they're chosen, and that's false. God's not a racist. God's not a respecter of persons. God doesn't care who you're descended from, and you shouldn't either. It shouldn't matter to you whether a person's black or brown or red or whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. God doesn't. God's made us all of one blood. And... Um, Jesus Christ shed his blood for, for everybody in the whole world. Jesus Christ loved every single ethnicity the same. It doesn't matter to him. Everybody, we all receive salvation as a gift, no matter who you are, no matter where you are born. And, and don't let this, this, this poor, prideful attitude um, sink in as to think that, that one race is better than another, or one people is better than another, because they're not. And, um, you know, no man should be called common or unclean. 
Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this great truth. Lord, um, there's nothing new under the sun, and, and some things just, just never seem to go away. Lord, um, the, this idea of racism and, and people who think that, that certain races are superior is just foolishness. And um, Lord, I thank you for, for the Bible. I thank you for showing us that um, you know, we shouldn't call any man common or unclean. And um, we thank you for all the, the, the beasts of the earth and, the, and the, the, everything you provided for us to be meat for us, dear Lord. Help us not to get sucked into these people that are that are part of the Hebrews Roots movement and people who think that we need to be obeying a lot of these, these laws that were laid forth that you've done away with at the, with the time of Reformation when Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, dear Lord. Um, help us not get deceived into thinking that, that we still have to obey those, um, those dietary restrictions as you've obviously lifted them. We thank you for this chapter and for showing us these great truths from the Bible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah. All right.